the second episode of the luminosity of free software. Uh, I hope we have a really good show today. I think we've got some good topics as well as some questions already lined up from people that commented on the uh, the blog entries and the Google Plus um, updates. So we've got a number of things to get through, and I think it's going to be quite cool. So the just as a recap, the topics that I want to talk about really quickly before we get to the open participation segment uh, is in no particular order, except it's the order I'm going to do them in. Marble, cool things you can do with it. If you haven't seen Marble recently, yeah, it's really quite impressive what it can do now. Uh, second of all, I wanted to talk briefly about this phenomenon of really important big free software projects forking. And this, I, I think, has a lot of uh, implications for the future of free software, especially on the client side, because that seems to be where a lot of the forking is happening, although not exclusively. And then I'm going to give an update on Vivaldi hardware. Uh, I know a lot of people have been very patiently waiting for this information. I've got some really interesting news. And then we're going to open it up um, to everyone, including a few questions that were written in. Great, and people are still joining, so that's tremendous. So we, we're going to start with um, Marble, and hopefully screen share works this time. You should now be seeing uh, Marble up on your screen, which it looks like you are. This is brilliant. So this is Marble. What is Marble? It's a open source free software mapping tool. And I've actually got it loaded with the OpenStreetMap um, data set, which you know you need to be on. Well, you don't have to be online, as we'll see in a second. But it is OpenStreetMap is the Wikipedia of maps, and it is amazing how accurate it is. I wrote briefly the other week about the uh, Google Maps doing a bunch of PR about oh we now have Pyongyang in North Korea mapped. And I looked at OpenStreetMap and Pyongyang on Google Maps, and it was dramatically um, more detailed in OpenStreetMap. Um, and when I started looking, when I posted that, a lot of people started posting about their areas of the world and saying, yeah, it's better here too. And I looked around a few places, um, you know, places you'd, you'd think Google Maps would be a lot better, Venice, for instance. And OpenStreetMap often has a lot more detail. So this is where I live, and right now, anyways, in, in Zurich, in Switzerland. And I'm viewing the OpenStreetMap, and if you go to the Map View tab over here, you can actually see there's quite a few different mapping options that you can use. Um, there's a plain geographic map, and there's even historical maps which are kind of interesting. But I, for tonight, you know, I'm only going to spend three, four, five minutes on this. I want to stick to the OpenStreetMap stuff. So. Uh, this is the traditional 2D map. It has some neat features, like you can do hill shading and get a nice idea of, of elevations and what have you. Um, zooming is pretty good. And of course, as I said, you know, this is online data, so you need to be online in theory. Well, that's one of the nice things. Um, you'll notice I'm actually using the new menus, application menus that are new in 4.10 um, of Plasma Workspaces. Uh, so it's really nice, keeps the menu up in the corner. Complete beside the point. So, but what um, you can do is you can download region from the file menu. And you can either specify a region if you know your longitude, latitude, which is a little geeky maybe, but useful if you're actually doing, you know, actual mapping. I just stick with the visible region area. I zoom into what I want and then I hit visible region. The zoom level, I wish this was a little bit better, a little bit more usable. Um, but basically, the higher the number, the greater the detail. And so usually just ramp this up to 16 and it says, gives you the estimated download size and you hit OK and it downloads it. I've actually already downloaded all of uh, Zurich. It took, I think, 15 megabytes and the surrounding area as well. And I have complete detail. Um, all offline, which is really nice. So I can take my laptop around and do whatever I want. So that's the first kind of neat thing you can do with it. Uh, routing. This is something that we think of in terms, you know, routing that's for, you know, GPS units. That's, you know, what Google Maps does and whatnot. Well, that is not completely true anymore. So I'm going to look for, let's see, if I go from my place 
should, should find, Oop, if I actually spell it right, there it is. And I'm going to go downtown, so I want to find out how to get to the main station. There we go. And there it is. And I'm going to say get directions. You can do it by car, bicycle, pedestrian. They don't have um, transit yet, which is unfortunate. But I'll get directions, and there it is. I have all my directions in place. You can click on each um, item. It also shows, if you notice, there's a gray line here, and this is an alternate route, and you can click on that to get an alternate route. If you have a GPS on your device, you can turn left, right, etc., and it'll actually follow you as you go. Which brings you to the next kind of neat thing. If you right-click or go into the menus again, there's info boxes. One of them is routing. One of them is also a speedometer. Well, I'm actually not traveling. I'm going at a very safe for you know video casting zero kilometers an hour. Uh, but if you're actually traveling and have a GPS, you have full routing controls and a speedometer built in as well. A lot of these tools are used for the mobile version, which makes a little more sense, perhaps. And you have things like elevation profiles, GPS info, etc., which is pretty cool, I think, for um, a desktop app. The other really cool thing you can do, uh, or one of the other really cool things you can do, is the online services. And there's a lot of them, everything from photos and postal codes, um, satellites, if you're zoomed out, which we'll look at in a second. Um, you can get the weather. So if I zoom out here, you'll actually start telling me how, well, I guess cold it is right now. Um, if you mouse over it, it tells you more information about the weather station. And another really nice one is the Wikipedia info box. And I think it really shows the real power of this. What's nice is as you zoom in, it actually does resolve more detail. So we'll go here. Um, I actually don't know what this... Oh, this is the, okay, the Altstadt of Zuri. Okay, interesting. General information. Um, what's this one here? Zumthaus, uh, Um If we come up here, here is uh, the Lindenhof Hill. Um, and this is, you know, it's the Wikipedia page, and it loads it directly right inside. And they did a lot of work on making the uh, HTML embedded uh, work quite nicely, which is pretty easy with WebKit, thankfully. Um, and as you know, you can print, etc. So I think that's really neat. It allows you to explore a place, get routing directions, save maps offline, all the stuff you really want. And if we zoom out here, and I mean way out, let me turn off the weather. I don't think we need weather anymore at this level. We actually also see another cool thing, which is the um, stars. So this is rel somewhat relatively new. Um, uh, you can actually see the, the stars. And they have maps for the moon now that you can get, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and in general, they've in, just improved the UI overall. They have this nice, more, much more modern looking um, navigation control. So I think they've done a great job on this. If you haven't checked out Marble recently, it's definitely worth it. I use it fairly regularly, regularly these days. Great. So back to me. Um, the next topic that I wanted to discuss um, before the everyone gets involved bit um, is a, sex, or a segment I thought of calling Forkerific. And this is a really, I think, interesting phenomenon that's happened in the last few years. Um, in, you know, up until maybe 2005 or so, most free software projects and their communities behind them simply try to get enough traction to build that momentum to get big enough to be used by uh, people. There was very few that, uh, free software applications I could say, yeah, we dominate. I mean, there was Apache that really rose really quickly. There was, of course, the Linux kernel, which just you know, really started to gain all sorts of traction. But other than that, there weren't so many. Um, but that's changed. There's a lot of very successful free software projects. And as a result, or maybe not as a result, but as has happened, there have been a lot of really high-profile forks. And it kind of divides, it seems, at least to me, into two categories. One is the uh, corporate purchase gone bad, which would kind of include the MySQLs and the open offices. And then there's the community growing pains, 
which maybe we we see around uh, GNOME Shell with you know Cinnamon and Mate, and just recently uh, GNOME Panel was was um, picked up by somebody else. It's going to be maintained outside. Um, and I think it's really interesting to contrast these with some of the other projects in the same areas who've managed to keep their, their communities coherent over the same period, uh, such as PostgreSQL um, or XFCE or, or KDE. So I think it's really interesting to look at the MySQL and OpenOffice sides. Um, the MySQL side, uh, just recently in the news, a couple of major distributions, Fedora, OpenSUSE, um, switched to the fork, which is an interesting fork because it actually was done by the guy who started MySQL in the first place, the MariaDB, um, which is just a fork of MySQL, and they're essentially drop-in replacements for each other. Um, I'm not sure how brilliant that, I mean, it's really nice people switching from one to the other, but I imagine that that causes some some headache for packagers, maybe. I'm not a packager. But the MySQL one, it was purchased for a huge amount of money, I think uh, around one billion US dollars, um, by Sun Microsystems, and then Sun gets you know, sucked into Oracle, and Oracle is a database vendor. It's the database vendor, practically, right, in the commercial world. So a lot of people were wondering, oh, how is this going to uh, impact MySQL? And they said, no, no, we're going to continue developing it, um, and they are. Uh, but a bunch of people, including the founder of MySQL, decided to do their own thing and fork and start something else. Um, I think this really says a lot about how careful free software products have to be when they get involved with very large companies or allow you know a buyout um, to occur. And I think it's also incumbent on free software communities to ensure that the source code and, and the project infrastructure behind these projects that may get bought out actually have some sort of provision built in that ensures longevity so that a single company can't come in, buy it, and then put it in a situation that you know instigates these kinds of forks. Um, open Office, now we don't know what's going to happen, I don't think particularly with the MySQL one yet, it's still I think fairly early. The Open Office fork is even more fascinating. It also involves Oracle uh, and Sun, um, but of course LibreOffice forks off of this and they've actually been remarkably successful. They just released 4.0, so congratulations to those uh, the people involved with that. Um, but they've been really, really successful and other free software projects uh, or, uh, so, or distributions, I should say, um, switched to LibreOffice some time ago. Uh, they started their own foundation, got a really good community basis. So forking isn't always bad, um, but when we look at even now with the releases of uh, OpenOffice, now Apache OpenOffice, and LibreOffice going on, it, there's confusion in the market, and that's not the best of things. I don't have any answers for how do we resolve these kinds of forks. Um, I think it's though something that the free software world is going to see more of and should probably be thinking about how to deal with. Uh, the GNOME shell is a bit different. It wasn't uh, because of corporate intervention, although companies have definitely been involved in one way or the other, but it's more of a you know, community cohesion issue where the community just said, we don't agree anymore and we're going to agree to disagree and move in our own separate directions. Um, as opposed to these splits like OpenOffice to LibreOffice, uh, where most of the developers, in fact, pretty, in the LibreOffice situation, from what I understand, pretty much all the developers except the ones paid by IBM moved to it. Um, and so community cohesion was still there. This kind of fork is perhaps a little more unfortunate, um, or these kinds of forks that we see in GNOME Shell, a little bit more unfortunate because the community starts to split up. Um, I really hope it, it works out, and I don't think there's much of a long-term future for all of these really small distro-specific desktop environments. It's just, it's, I mean, I can speak from personal experience here, it's really difficult work, it's hard to maintain over years of time, um, and you really benefit from the network effect of having a lot of broad support. So I don't really think there's a lot of, a really great future for all of them. I think that it will re-coalesce into a smaller number. Um, but I look at groups like XFCE who have managed to keep their community together, and it can be done. But I think we really need to think about as a free software you know, meta community about you know, these kinds of forks that are happening. Um, I think maybe it's, are there ways of, of us avoiding them or preventing them or when they do happen, how can we deal with them slightly better than what's happened on the desktop side, I think. So just things to think about, I think.
Uh, the last bit, maybe the more interesting of the three topics for some people, at least it is for me, and that's the Vivaldi hardware. Uh, so to recap really quickly, we started Plasma Active, um, so it seems like years ago now, but it wasn't that long ago. We made three releases. Uh, it's a little over a year old, um, maybe coming up a year, not quite a half, um, if we start the very, very beginning. And we eventually, after talking with a lot of hardware vendors and, and groups, we realized that it would be very hard to get vendors on board um, without someone taking the first plunge. And at one of the developer meetings, I suggested that if we want to see it happen, we'd probably have to take the first step ourselves. And at the time, it seemed kind of crazy and not possible, and I don't think anyone in the room really took me seriously, um, which is sometimes a good sign, sometimes it's not a good sign. <laughs> um, but I said, I think this is what's going to end up having to happen. And eventually, I decided, fine, let's just do it. Hmm. I have my KDE mug, by the way, which you probably can't see because of that horrible resolution, um, and coffee. Anyway, so I decided, well, let's do something about this. And our first game plan was to start talking with various manufacturers in China, see what they had off the shelf, you know, pre-done packages, and work from there. And we rapidly, I mean, we knew we were going to run into source code availability issues. There's GPL violations on almost every single piece of mid-tier hardware that comes out of China right now. Um, I was, in fact, I was a month or two ago working with a, manu or a reseller in the US that thought they had a completely open source free software tablet running Android, and they didn't. And it took about five minutes of looking through their kernel source tree to find entire binary drivers. Um, so they were given basically the vanilla kernel with a few fix ups and stuff that was non free. So this is typical. We knew we'd run into that. Uh, what we didn't expect to run into was business transigence um, on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, the high turnover without any sort of clear roadmap of the manufacturers there. They basically put out a product, run with it as, as long as possible, and then magically shift to something else. Um, there's no real reliability there. So we tied up with the manufacturer and we were we actually uh, had our first purchase order agreements in place. We thought, great, what can go wrong? Famous last words. Um, and what happened was we got a new developer version of the machine. It was supposed to be the same line. It was pretty different inside. Uh, so different that our uh, the OS no longer uh, booted properly on the new device. And then we found out that the next line they're coming out with was completely different again. So we had some real issues uh, with basic supply chain, um, uh, you know, reliability, uh, and we found we were having to reconvince them with every product. You no, know, you should release really source code. So we ran into this what felt like a brick wall. We gave it an extra month of just trying everything we could think of, and eventually went, "This is not going to work." So we started two things kind of in parallel. One was look for another vendor who has their head on right. Um, and simultaneously, which we all thought was the dark horse, there's no way it would be possible, uh, we started looking at designing our own system. And I mean from the ground up. Um, it turns out that the commodity or the, the integrated circuits that, are, that make up the pieces of a modern tablet are almost completely commodity chips. For any given chip you look at, whether it's the touchscreen IC, whether it's the uh, G sensor or whatever else, there's a handful of companies to a couple dozen companies, depending on which area you're looking at, in China that makes these in huge quantities. Um, and what building a tablet comes down to, it turns out, is picking a system on chip vendor and their chips and getting a good relationship with them picking a whole bunch, and I mean a whole bunch, of these circuits and individual components, uh, getting the PCB board design and the case design done, and then finding someone who can put it all together for you. I personally thought that would be an extreme trick to pull off um, doing all of this. We have been able to work with a couple of companies uh, in England 
and a few companies in China. Um, and what I'm really, really happy to uh, talk about or to tell you right now is we are actually at the point of factory tooling, which means that between now, we've got basically three months um, and devices start popping off the end of the factory line. Um, what's really nice is we're in full control of our roadmap now. So it's not a struggle just to get out device one, but we know what device two, device three, device four is like. The uh, system on chip vendor we're working with is actually supplying us with chips that are coming out only this year um, for our next revision, um, multi-core chips, etc. So we actually have the ability to build an actual roadmap, which is fantastic. Uh, and we're also able to do different form factors. Um, we can say we would like a case design for, say, a home PVR. Um, or we'd like a bigger tablet, or we want something that can fit in the back of a car seat, and we can actually get this designed and manufactured for us now. So we haven't made any official announcements yet. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of this month or the very beginning of March, uh, we'll have the tooling parts complete so that I can actually confidently show what the end result is going to look like uh, to everybody and not have to change the story as it goes. But that's the really good news. The weird news is that it meant we had to go through the whole process of making a device ourselves. It's better than what we were going to put out last year. Hopefully it was, you know, middle of last year we were planning on releasing, but it has a uh, higher resolution, more memory, um, et cetera. So really, really happy about that. Um, huge amount of work has gone into it. When we make the announcements, we'll be unveiling who our partners are uh, and making that happen, but I'm really excited. And we're still able to do the things we wanted to do, like if a company or a government or a school system says, we would like, you know, a thousand units uh, custom branded with, you know, a customized uh, OS image on it, we can do that. And we actually have them pop off the end of the, uh, the manufacturing line before they get shipped here. Um, have the right stuff on it. What's also nice is we've actually visited all of the manufacturing uh, facilities and they're actually, yeah, it, not sweatshops, which is nice. I, I'm not going to say that they're completely, you know, the most best imaginable, uh, you know, environmentally and whatnot. It, it's still China. Um, but as far as, you know, human rights and what goes, I think it's pretty good. So it's it was a massive stress that lifted off my shoulders. We still have a lot more work in the coming six weeks, but this is quite cool. And announcements will be coming soon, which means we'll have a device that we can run, uh, not, a, not just run Plasma Active on, but it'll be officially supported with a warranty that you can order and pop it out of a box. Um, I've been sitting on that news for two months now, uh, which is painful, uh, but I wanted to make sure that more of the pieces were, were in place. And we'll start doing the official announcements, like I said, um, closer to the end of the month, beginning of March. But yeah, this has uh, been quite the journey. Um, and it was funny because when we first did it, I thought, yeah, I would tell people, if you told me that I would do, be doing hardware um, a year ago, I'd be insane. I'd, I'd say you were insane. Um, and right now, I will tell you, if you had told me then, <laughs> um, this last summer, that we'd actually be designing our own device, I would have said you're insane. So I guess it's, it, it sometimes pays off not to know what your limits should be, um, but to simply go ahead and do it. So. That's, uh, that's the end of that section. Um, and now we'll move directly into the uh, more, I hope, fun section, which is the uh, user questions and, and feedback um, and participation side. So if you have questions, throw them into the chat. Um, and I'll start picking them. I'll even bring you on to the, uh, the, the Hangout if you want to do a back and forth a bit. Um, but I have two questions that were posted um, online already. I, and I don't know if the people were able to be here, so we'll cover these first. The first was um, by uh, Tobias Henze, and he wrote in, uh, it'd be nice if we could talk about Qt on other mobile platforms like Android, Blackberry, Windows Mobile 8, Windows RT. Can developers use QML on these platforms? So there's two stories. One is a porting story, and one is a native story. Um, I'll cover the porting story first, because it's simple. With Qt 5, 
there, well, with Qt 4, let's back up a second. With Qt 4, we had um, a Qt on Android project, and the KDE community actually hosted this code for quite a while. Uh, there was also, when, as Qt 5 started, a Qt on iOS project. Um, both have made releases, and both have, you can write applications for Android or iOS using Qt to varying degrees of success. The Android one is actually really high quality right now, and I've seen Q, QML applications running on Android, um, and it works quite nice. What's cool with Qt 5 is they're starting to roll these platforms in. I guess one of the benefits of, of not having Nokia as, you know, the the uh, ownership company or the company that owns Qt is a little more freedom in target without, you know, difficult uh, commercial or, or political questions. And so these formerly external um, efforts, such as the Android port, are actually being rolled right into Qt. Um, so yes, you can run QML applications on these platforms. Then there's the native story. BlackBerry 10 is their UI is based on QML. They have their own thing. So when they start development, um, Qt components for QML, which as you may or may not know, is the uh, kind of the widgets uh, side of QML. Um, very much like what we had started to do with Plasma with QML and other people had started to do, um, including BlackBerry. And so they have this thing called Cascades, which is their own thing. Um, Ubuntu phone, I don't know how Commercially successful will be still yet to be seen. They said we're going to have phones at the end of this year. Um, I have marked it down on my calendar to fact check that one when it when it happens. Uh, they're also native Qt QML. Uh, they also have their own theming system. So the native story is quite interesting. We have BlackBerry, uh, we have Ubuntu Phone, we have Plasma Active. Um, these are all building natively on Qt QML. You can also do this on Nemo, uh, which is a community, another community OS uh, built on top of Mer, which is what Migo evolved into, the community continuation of Migo, really. So there is a bit of a, a sniggle with all of these. So you can use the upcoming components, Qt components that come with Qt, but it won't quite look native on all these platforms. It'll look cute and beautiful, excuse the pun for cute, uh, but it won't be a perfect fit. We all have our own kind of APIs for these things, and we're now, right now, working on bringing these APIs together, so hopefully in a year's time, uh, say, so by maybe 2014 early, you'll be able to write not just with QML and use that one system, but you'll also be able to have a single packaging format and a single you know, baseline API. Vendors may add on to it, um, and the packaging system that we already have in Plasma Active, which BlackBerry is looking at right now, and, and uh, we're looking at basing something in Qt off of this, um, allows you to have uh, device or operating system and device and input method, etc., uh, specific target code um, and QML in your package. So you would be able to use the base API, have one, you know, QML application that'll look and run native on all of these native uh, QML platforms. Uh, so we're getting there. It's maybe a little bit ass backwards doing it after the fact, but I think everyone who got involved with the QML Qt thing, it was all speculative. We're all kind of putting a bet on this technology panning out. And now that it's working well, we're kind of reconverging. So I think this story for Qt and QML and mobile in the next year is fantastic. Whether you're interested in, in Android, iOS, BlackBerry 10, uh, Ubuntu Phone, or Plasma Active, or all of them, it's a great solution, I think. So, uh, yes, and Marco brings out, a, I knew I was forgetting one, Sailfish. So Sailfish um, there with Yola uh, out of Finland, a bunch of ex-Nokians rolled out to do a mobile phone platform. This is also cute QML. Um, and I, I get this, this suspicion we're going to see a few more cute QML uh, approaches in the future. Okay, second question from a Luis, I don't know anything more than that, his, his first name. Um, he asked, you know, could I talk about Google and other service providers like G+, Facebook, etc., being great for exactly what we're doing, which is video meetups and hangouts. Um, they're very fine-tuned and easy to get started with and free. Yeah, except as we saw at the beginning of this one, always not completely easy. Um, there's still some bugs to work out in hangouts, it seems. Um, 
And he says, I think we should try to improve on free software tools that enable anyone to provide these kinds of services in a privacy and security oriented way. Things like SecureShare, SecureShare.org, Friendica, Friendica.com, Friendica Red, Newsforo, Etherpads, Own Cloud, maybe an integration of those or an effort to help out with SecureShare. I think that this is a really, really good point. When I did this, you know, weekly kind of broadcast um, four, four years ago or something like this. Um, I was using proprietary software on the web as well. It was the only thing that could really easily do it. And I tried some free software tools and they just didn't work very well. Here we are, years later, nothing's really changed. And part of it is that, okay, we have a bandwidth issue, right? Um, these things take lots of bandwidth. You know, moving video around is expensive. At the same time, um, our server provider gives us an insane amount of bandwidth every month for an extremely low cost. So I think the bandwidth issue is starting to go away. More importantly, I think it'd be really nice to see uh, some innovation and some competition in this space. Uh, Google Hangouts is pretty good. I think it's the best I've seen so far, and it's still exceedingly rough. Um, and it's not free software, and it doesn't let you have much to say in terms of privacy and security of your data, etc. And these are, I think, really big issues. I don't have an answer for this. Um, I already have enough on my plate. I can't run off and do this. But I hope that you know other people will think about these same things, and instead of just thinking about it, might actually start doing something uh, about it. We really need this kind of you know, thing in free software. We're starting to see some uh, efforts you know, like own cloud uh, come up. The OpenStack world as well is really quite interesting. We've also seen some struggles. You know, Identica, um, there was an Amazon API. Uh, uh, it was, it, what was the name of it? I forget the name of it. Um, but they had cloned it. It was an open core business, I think, that held them back quite a bit. Um, we have some really great stars like Colab um, and Open Exchange, so it's possible. Um, and if you can do a groupware server, which is exceedingly complex and takes time, and it took them years to get there, I can only imagine that we could do something like this. Especially now that we have tools like WebEx. I'm not a huge fan of HTML5 for a lot of things it said it should be for, desktop apps and mobile, and but for things like video. Uh, collaboration over the network, I think HTML5 is going to be an absolute godsend because it will allow uh, free software developers to actually create platforms a lot easier because they won't have to worry about the, uh, the video side of it and the audio, the multimedia side essentially. That they can you say, no, the HTML5 is going to handle that and we just need to interface with it. So really good question. I wish I had a better answer than we need to do something, but we need to do something. Okay, so that's everything that I had prepared. Um, I've already yam yammered on for quite some time. Um, let's open it up to questions. I'm looking over here in the uh, group chat box. Uh, feel free to pepper me with, with questions. And there are none. Did I answer everyone's questions? Maybe everyone's just fallen over dead. <laughs> yes, Nuno just posted his dead face. That's great. Um, ah, I, I didn't see this earlier. Um, Diego asked if I could, while I was talking about uh, Vivaldi hardware, um, if I could later on talk about making a spin of Vivaldi as a ROM replacement for Nexus devices. So there actually already is such a project. Um, and it's, so I should make a clarification here. Um, so we don't call the Vivaldi the plasma active tablet, which would be actually a pretty cool thing. We call it PAT. Hmm. Um, but we don't call it the Plasma Active Tablet quite specifically because it's not the Plasma Active Tablet. It's Vivaldi. It's its own thing. It uses Plasma Active in it. But Plasma Active for us, even though we're putting out this hardware product, is still the, the key. Um, and so I wear 
a couple of hats simultaneously. Uh, and one of them is being involved with Plasma Active. Um, we fund development of it, we put money into it, um, and we're going to be making a hardware product, but it needs to be something that is multi-vendor. And we don't fear competition. We think it's the best thing we could ever have happen if we had, you know, 50 different vendors coming out with plasma active devices, tablets and PVRs and, you know, in-vehicle entertainment or whatever, you couldn't make me happier. Um, so I just want to make that really clear. There's, there will never be a Vivaldi spin for Nexus devices. But there will be a plasma active spin. In fact, people are already working on that. Um, let me get a link to it here. Oh wow, it was even on Slashdot. I missed that. Maybe it's because I try to avoid Slashdot um, in general as much as possible. Anyways, um, so here is a link to one of the blog entries. So the, the people who are working on it, on it are working on the Nexus 7 right now. Um, the OS um, adaptation is, you know, three steps forward, five steps back kind of thing. Um, sometimes five steps forward and one step back. But they're still working out some of the, the uh, hardware issues and all that. Um, when Canonical... Uh, announced that they had their images running on it. Um, <clears throat> basically, it meant it was booting, and some things were working, and some things weren't. And um, it takes time to do an a, a, uh, adaptation of any OS to a new piece of hardware like this. All the mobile hardware is slightly different from other bits of hardware. Um, so it's it's a work in progress. Uh, we're making good pace. Uh, the guys working on it are collaborating with the people who are doing the um, the Ubuntu stuff and, and whatnot, and uh, the Mer people. So it's 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 really cool. So yes, there will be a spin for Nexus devices. In fact, it's already being worked on, which is really really cool. Um, it also occurred to me because I, that I I kind of glossed over the freeness aspect of the uh, Vivaldi hardware. Um, probably because I'm you know eating and breathing this every day that these things seem obvious and I forget to talk about them. Uh, one of the really cool things about us picking every component inside um, is other than the GPU, which is uh, something that just comes with a system on chip, virtually everything else we picked. So we picked the CPU, which we have open support for. The GPU is a Mali 400 which we have a better X11 driver for than we had last year. We have um, some pieces of it have actually open sourced. Uh, uh, the kernel bits were already open sourced, but a few more pieces have. We still have a binary blob driver uh, for this. Um, but all the rest of it is open, and we've been able to ensure this is the case because we picked the Wi-Fi chip, we picked the G sensor, we picked the uh, touch IC, etc. So that's kind of neat. Um, one other really, really strange bit about it uh, compared to most other devices is the CPU that goes on it, or the system on chip, uh, is actually on what can best be described as a daughter board. Um, they're secured to the PCB, but it's not surface mounted onto the PCB, which means that we're able to take the same base design in the PCB in case and replace the CPU, the storage, and the memory independently. Uh, this gives us an upgradable system, um, which is pretty different than the way it's usually done, uh, but it works rather quite well. So yeah, it's kind of a neat thing. Uh, EGL and X. So EGL and X on the device, um, we have uh, open, uh, we have EGLES, uh, open GLES. Why can't they give things just sensible names? Uh, two working just fine on the device. Um, the open source Lima driver just recently released some, uh, some meaningful, but not as meaningful as some people thought, uh, benchmarks, and they're making great progress. I, I'm this close to hoping that um, sometime this year, last year in the summer I said, give it a year or so and we'll, we, we might have shippable drivers. Um, I, I think this is still accurate. We, we may even have an open driver by, you know, later this year. Um, but OpenGLS 2 already works. 
um, and we have the ears, uh, minds, and attention of the people who make these chips. So if we run into issues, um, we can address them. I mean, we want to get Wayland on there as soon as possible. Uh, that'll be a Framework uh, 5 Plasma Workspaces 2 project, um, but we want to get that on there with Wayland. So this is obviously very important. Uh, yes, whether it's just EGL or also works with X, it also works with X. So the, the X driver actually does use the OpenGL stack. Um, there are a few bits that use a shadow frame buffer in it right now, which isn't great um, for performance. Um, and it sucks more battery. But that's also being worked on. Um, Cuba Serafino. Hey, dude. Let's see. So uh, Cuba asks, he's wondering if it is the purpose of Evaldi um, and active, I mean, the relation between them, are you just doing it for fun, or you just want to sell hardware and make money on it, or is it the way around? Is it still just a proof of concept? Um, so I, I think I, I did cover that just uh, a minute ago about the competition aspect of it and how we'd love to see competitors. Um, but the relationship between them is we think Plasma Active is an excellent, amazing starting point for any device. And we've put a lot of effort into the tablet uh, side of it and, we'll, and are continuing to, um, and we're putting out a tablet product. So Plasma Active as a free software project must remain vendor neutral, must remain open participation wise as well as code. Uh, and that will, that's going to continue. Um, I'm doing it, yes, as a hobby. People often ask, you know, are you doing it as a hobby or for work? As if the two things have to be exclusive. Um, you can magically sometimes manage to do your hobby for work. Um, I believe in this project quite, quite um, deeply. Uh, so it's what I'm doing for work, as a few others are also working on it uh, full time. Um, so we're doing it, you know, as work, but Plasma Active stands on its own. Vivaldi is a product, a hardware product that uses Plasma Active, um, and yes, our complete intention is to sell them and make money doing it, um, so that we can actually hire more people and invest even more into the the Plasma Active frameworks. Um, uh, we. Obviously, everyone needs to eat and pay rent and whatnot, and we see Vivaldi as one way of driving revenue into the ecosystem around it. Um, and that includes KDE, it includes Plasma Active, it includes things like MER. Um, it looks like um, this year we'll end up sponsoring some build servers, for instance, um, for the MER project and their OBS. Um, so we want to in increase our investment. And the only way that we can do that is if we make some money. So um, the Vivaldi platform is designed to, to do that. Um, and the relationship between them is that we have to work on both. Uh, Tom Albers asked, is Synchrotron still developed? Yes, it is. I mean, it works for what I need it to do. Um, if people have feature requests. Oh, for people who don't know, Synchrotron is a really, really tiny, small web app that speaks the um, open uh, collaboration services API just to deliver uh, update or um, yeah, updates as well, but add-ons, non-compiled add-ons for applications. So KDevelop uses it to get API documentation. Um, we can use it in Plasmoids to get um, updates for you know, various bits of, of data gathering engines um, uh, for the desktop. Uh, it does what we need it to do. What I'd like to complete for Frameworks 5 is more of the client side. So a, um, uh, a set of, of, of classes that work a little bit better with it. We have Attica, LibAttica, which you can use to access it because it speaks the OCS API. But there's a few things that are a little bit clumsy, I think, with Attica because Attica is designed as a more of a full, um, you know, social platform, which really, I, I think, could be a lot easier. Or we we can we can design something a lot more streamlined for this. That said, um, we've also developed something called Bodega, which is also in Katie's Git. It's a Node.js based server implementation. And you can also, you can even purchase things, you can sell things via it uh, if you wish. And it's a lot more robust and has a lot more features. Um, I would personally like to see Bodega uh, supplants um, Synchrotron for our uses in Plasma Desktop, just because we can do a lot more with it. Um, I'd love to see other applications in KDE um, 
uh, access it. The main advantages are that like Synchrotron, with Synchrotron an application can say, you know, here's our application, here's the different kinds of add-ons we have. They don't have to talk to any system administrator. The application developers, as long as they have access to the repository, can define all this themselves. With Bodega it goes one step further. Not only can an application provider uh, or developer say, here are my add-ons, here's the kind of add-ons, but then they can also go in and do things like say, I would like them to be, you know, grouped into these categories, um, and you basically can build your own, you know, app store or add-on store. I don't mean store in the sense you can buy it, but stores in storage. So you, you can have a, you know, multi-layered um, or, or a multi uh, level tree of, of content. And this is something that each application uh, developer can, can uh, determine for themselves. So this would enable groups, um, you know, such as people working on the, you know, open games stuff in KDE um, to, you know, provide a way to uh, not only ship their own games, but provide a platform for third parties to upload games and even if they wanted to even monetize them. It's a, it's a lot more sophisticated of a platform. We have QML bindings on the client side. That's actually what Active Add-ons uses. Uh, we have a C++ library that sits in behind it. So if you're doing a more traditional um, uh, thing, you can do that. It has a JSON API that it speaks over the, over the wire, over HTTP. Um, and there's actually in development right now a web, a, a web front end for it um, that you can run. It's all HTML5, so you can run it locally or will be able to run it locally uh, or over a web server um, to get stuff uh, through a web browser. So it's really flexible, and I think it's a slightly, you know, more sensible forward dire or, uh, direction forward. So I hope I haven't blasted too much information all at once. Any other questions before I I give up? My, my coffee cup is almost empty. It's kind of like my, uh, uh, my hourglass. When I'm out of coffee, that's it. It's all over, folks. <laughs> so I'll take one more question if there is one. Yes, it is a KDE cup, um, which you can't see overly well because um, do I have? Let me stick my phone in it because that's hygienic for it. Um, yes, it has the KDE logo, which I can't get the, the camera to focus on. But yeah, it's a nice frosted glass with KDE, KDE logo on it. It's actually one of my favorite cups. My other favorite cup is my um, Penguin Power Cup, which you'll see me with on Hangouts uh, as well. So because I am truly just that geeky. I, I'm even wearing a Google Summer of Code shirt. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's no hope for me. All right, well, thanks everybody for showing up. I hope you found it interesting and entertaining. Um, every week, as I mentioned before in the pre-show, every week I'm gonna try and, and upgrade one piece of the show. So this week I did a bit of work on the YouTube page where the hangout, these Hangouts end up. Um, I will be getting a nice little start graphic uh, for the Hangouts, um, and I have to give a, a shout out to uh, my son, uh, who's actually been doing the graphic design work. Um, he's a cool little kid. Uh, Ivan says for the next one, a strip tease. Well, if you insist. Um, yes, maybe I'll end the show that way instead of beginning and chase everyone away. Um, but yes, just for you, Ivan, a strip tease. Uh, but yeah, so I'll be slowly upgrading various bits. I'm going to get a better camera, better lighting, etc. Um, because these are proving to be pretty fun to do. So that's it for this week. Um, thanks for, for coming out, everybody. And I'm going to hit the end broadcast uh, now, but we can continue on uh, in the Hangout until we wish. Cheers.